This video is sponsored by Normandy 1998, Ash, and Team Valor. Hey everyone, Merry Christmas! To celebrate the holidays, I thought I'd share the third part of my Patreon exclusive series with you. If you'd like to gain access to the rest, the next eight parts are up on Patreon with more to come in the new year. Link in the description. Also, if you'd like to help me have an extra Merry Christmas, drop a like on this video and subscribe to the channel, since both will tell YouTube not to leave a lump of coal in my stocking. But with that said, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and let's get on with the story. A week has passed since Ash has lost the Lavridge Gym, and during that time he has devoted himself to one activity and one activity alone, training. Every waking moment from the second he opens his eyes till the moment they hammer shut from exhaustion is spent either in training or in thought for how to train next. Seeing how fired up he is, Ash's Pokemon do their part to match their trainer's enthusiasm, with each giving 110%. Though these six are not the only ones, as soon they find themselves being joined by a host of other friends, as Ash recalls all his old Pokemon from Smoke slabs so they can get in on the training as well. Ash is of course delighted to be reunited with so many old friends, while his reserves are equally eager to show off how much they have grown during their time at the lab. Ash's 30 Tauros are as rambunctious as ever, while Kingler and Bulbasaur are mercifully more low-key, with the latter quickly striking up a friendship with Trico, which stands in stark contrast to its relationship with Bayleaf. The same cannot be said for Ash's Flyers, as while Skarmory has deigned to train with the others, if only so it can get strong enough to beat Typhlosion, it and Noctowl do not become fast friends. However, to Ash's surprise, Noctowl manages to hold its own against Skarmory when the armor bird decides to lash out its avian counterpart, proving that it's been working hard since returning from Johto. As for the remainder of Ash's Pokemon from the lab, Quilava and Heracross remain as strong as ever, both glad to be back, while Snorlax mostly sleeps and Muck is… well Muck, though even it too demonstrates a growth in power when forced to cease its smothering hugs long enough to battle. For this is Ash's primary method of training, having his Pokemon spar with each other while rotating opponents as a way to hone their strengths as well as assess any weaknesses against a myriad of different types and styles of fighter. While all his Pokemon enjoy this chance to test themselves, two in particular go all out when paired with each other, that being Trico and Bayleaf. Even though Bulbasaur has tried to act as a mediator, their feud is not lessened in the slightest, and so whenever she is given the chance, Bayleaf does her best to teach the little gecko some respect, while also proving her superiority as Ash's best grass starter and the true ace of his home team. This in turn forces Trico to push itself to its limits, going so far as to evolve during one of their more intense matches. The power Grovile gets from its evolution is nothing short of stunning, as in an instant it is able to go toe to toe with Bayleaf and end this match in a draw. Naturally, Bayleaf is furious at this change in dynamic, with her only growing more aggravated when following a post-battle snack of berries, Grovile also shows itself capable of now using a grass type move, that being Bullet Seed, as it spits out the berries pips at high speed, while Kingler uses its bubbles both as demonstration and target practice. As a result of this, Bayleaf redoubles her already dedicated effort, working longer and harder than any of Ash's other Pokemon, her sole solace being the praise her beloved trainer gives her at the end of each match. Eventually, one last old friend does make their way to the Hoenn region, though unlike the others, it is not from Oak's lab. Instead, they arrive by their own volition, having crossed the sea to be here, all the way from Jota's Characific Valley. Those who know Charizard greet the Fire Lizard warmly, while those who don't are happy to make his acquaintance. That is except for Skarmory, who upon laying eyes upon the Fire type, calls out a challenge and immediately slashes its face with its serrated talons. However, as Skarmory soon learns, this is a dreadfully poor decision, as Charizard is not been slacking during its training, and so uses this opportunity to demonstrate the new move it has learned, Overheat. This powerful burst of flame is enough to drop the avian menace in one hit, a feat which impresses everyone, and as Ash comes over to welcome it, the fire starter gives Ash its standard greeting, roaring proudly, then scorching his face with flamethrower. Unfortunately, not all the reunions had here are happy ones, as with all of Ash's Pokemon being in one place, it is only a matter of time before this draws the attention of Team Rocket. Thinking they have hit the jackpot, Pot, Jesse, James, and Meowth wait until all the Pokemon have tucked themselves out from training before swooping down in the dead of night to pull for every last one of them for the boss. Alas, this is a dream denied, as while stumbling through the dark, James accidentally steps on Snorlax's paw, waking the gluttonous normal type prematurely and causing it to vent its frustration about this fact on the azure haired thief. This in turn rouses Ash and the rest of the Pokemon, with the boy rallying them all for a combined attack on the crooks. Against such firepower, the trio stand no chance 
moments, and so in a matter of moments are sent blasting off again. From here on out, the rest of the training goes to plan, with Charizard being an invaluable asset as its status as a powerful fire starter makes it a great standard for Old Man Moore's Typhlosion. Thanks to Charizard, not only do the trio who fought Typhlosion soon feel confident in their ability to rematch the Fire Weasel, but the rest of Ash's team also develop a number of strategies to combat fire types, which will no doubt serve them well in the future. However, all good things must come to an end, as after two weeks, Charizard bids its trainer and friends farewell, with plans to return to the Charisific Valley. But the gloominess of its departure is not a long-lasting one, as that night Ash makes a big declaration that he thinks they're finally ready to go back and challenge Old Man Moore. The next morning, Ash, Brock, and their Pokémon return to the Lava Ridge Gym, eager to undertake their rematch, only to be met by Flannery, who tells them her grandpa left last night on a journey to study Pokémon poetry and won't be back for a while. After all his hard work, this comes as a heavy blow to Ash, who quickly finds himself slumped in a corner dejectedly, while Pikachu gives him comforting backpats. However, Big Bro Brock has a solution, giving Flannery his details and urging her to contact them when Mr. Moore returns, saying this might be a blessing in disguise, since it gives Ash a chance to train even more, since one can never be too prepared against a former Elite Four member. Though still dejected, Ash accepts this, promising to come back as soon as Old Man Moore returns and win his badge for sure. Now with the gym battle postponed, it is time for the team to get back on the road, though this presents something of a conundrum for Ash, who after spending so much time with all his Pokemon friends, must narrow them down to a team of six again for the next leg of his journey. Naturally, Pikachu as his best buddy will be coming along, as will Skarmory for Professor Oak's peace of mind. Ash also wants to keep up his training with Groval and see how its evolution will affect it, which means Bayleaf will be staying too, since when he suggests the possibility of her returning to the lab while Groval remains on the team, she bursts into tears and headbutts him painfully in the stomach. As for the final two members, Ash chooses Fanpy, since it is the youngest of his Pokemon, and a dark horse, or rather, dark bull, in one of his Tauros, who is eager to travel with Ash, having never really done so before. Having made his decision, Ash bids goodbye to the rest of his friends, encouraging them to keep training when they get back to the lab, a sentiment all his Pokemon agree with, though surprisingly none more than Noctowl, whose eyes glint in a way that makes the boy wonder if it has already been training alongside a partner considering its marked growth. While on the phone with Oak, facilitating the return transfer, Ash asks the professor about this, wondering if maybe one of Gary's Pokemon has been helping his shiny flyer, but the old man simply replies that Noctowl has been taking day trips away from the lab, so he imagines if it's been training, that's when it's been happening, but he'll happily follow up on that for Ash if he would like. Ash thanks his mentor for this assistance, and as the last Pokeball appears on Oak's side, hangs up the phone and resumes his journey at last. For the next leg of the journey, Ash volunteers to navigate, feeling confident that he can get them to Fortree City without issue. Wanting to give his friend a win after the dual disappointments of losing to Mr. Moore and being denied his rematch, Brock acquiesces and almost immediately comes to regret it, as the directionally challenged Ash somehow leads them to a port city not on Brock's map. Wanting to stop in and get their bearings before he takes over the navigation, Brock leads Ash into this nameless city, only to be stopped when the wailing of a klaxon sounds the moment they enter town. For a moment, the duo wonder if this is something to do with them, only for the voice of Officer Jane to ring out through the city's PA, calling for an emergency evacuation, though she gives no mention of where to or why. Wanting to find these answers, Ash with Pikachu by his side sprints off for the center of town, only to be stopped when they come face to face with Jenny herself, as she tears through the streets on her motorcycle, repeating the warning. Finding a new burst of speed at the sight of his beloved Jenny, Brock sprints over to join her and Ash, with the pair of boys asking what they are meant to be evacuating from. Hopefully Jenny Jenny explains that this city is subject to annual gulpin attacks, in which the wild gulpins swarm in and consume all the food. Ash calls this terrible, offering to help, with Brock nodding along, and seeing that they are Pokemon trainers, Jenny enlists their help, saying that soon one of the world's leading gulpin researchers will be conducting a test of something that might rid them of the gulpin once and for all, so if they want to help out, they should come with her to the test site and make sure the gulpin don't interfere. Nodding, Ash and Brock follow Jenny to a small plaza with a bridge, where an elderly bearded man in lab coat is waiting. Smiling, he introduces himself as Professor Jacuzzi and explains how he has manufactured a special Poke block designed to attract Gulpin and has rigged it up to a drone which will carry it out of town. He then unveils his creation and urges the boys and Jane to stand back, as now that its scent is in the air, the Gulpin will be here within moments. Good to his word, a swarm of Gulpins soon bear down upon the tasty payload, and with the cheer that his life's work has been a success, Professor Jacuzzi activates the drone as it take flight. As planned, the Gulpin immediately 
rapidly follow after the drone, headed towards the outskirts of town. Though before they can get very far, something occurs which the plan did not account for. The arrival of Team Rocket. Reciting their motto with villainous glee, the Team Rocket trio declare that they don't know what this thing is, but if it has the twerp's attention, they'll be taking it. That is until they are promptly sent blasting off by the Gulpin, who do not appreciate good-for-nothing stealing their snacks. Thankfully, this brief overload does not damage the drone, though it takes a moment for Professor Jacuzzi to reinitialize the thrusters. Taking this as their cue, Ash and Brock step in. Following Officer Jenny's lead as she brings out a trio of grass-type Pokemon. And so it is that Lotad, Grovile, and Bayleaf stand guard against the gulp and long enough for Professor Jacuzzi to get the Pokeblock parcel back into the air, solving the city's problem for another year. Or so the heroes think. Unfortunately, Gulpins are voracious gluttons, meaning that when they devour the Pokeblock, they simply come back, this time hungrier than before, having had to trek all the way out of the city only to come back in. Thankfully, Professor Jacuzzi has a plan in place for this, though like before, he needs the help of Ash, Brock, and Jenny to defend the equipment while he carries it out. As it turns out, the plan is to use a device based on Gulpin's stockpile and spit-up moves to convert the Gulpin into energy and then fire them from a cannon back into the wild. For the most part, the plan is successful successful, as the team of grass types use their ineffective moves to stun the poison mob without injuring them, allowing for Jacuzzi to lock on and suck them up. Soon, only one Gulpin is left, and as the closest Pokemon, Ash orders Grovile to keep it in place with a bullet seed. However, feeling neglected in the wake of the Gecko's evolution, Bailey flexes to charge in first, using Body Slam to pin Gulpin down instead. The close proximity means that when Professor Jacuzzi's beam hits Gulpin, Bayleaf is caught in the crossfire, vanishing into the ether with it. Frantic Ash cries out for his friend, before demanding the Professor bring her back, though it seems the matter is out of his hands, as a moment later, both Bayleaf and Gulpin reappear, though now standing at roughly 50 feet tall. Professor Jacuzzi immediately tries to find a way to undo this process, with Brock helping as best he can, though this leaves Gulpin unattended, much to the stomach Pokemon's delight, as it can now go seek out food as it originally wanted. Unfortunately for everyone else, this search is even more destructive than before, as it flattens buildings beneath its pawn with the possibility of wrecking the entire city if its appetite is not satiated. Urgently, Ash cries for Bayleaf to do something to stop Gulpin, and with a big smile at having Ash's attention squarely on her, the grass stutter does so, wrapping her giant vines around Gulpin's body and hurling it into the side of a building. This catches the poison type's attention at last, with it using stockpile followed directly by spit up to launch car-sized bolts of energy at Bayleaf. These hits send the plant dinosaur staggering backwards, and not wanting to be disturbed again, Gulpin goes in for the finishing blow, splattering Bayleaf with a super effective sludge attack that makes her shriek and collapse on her side. Running over to her, Ash lays a hand on Bayleaf's giant snout, pleading with her to be okay, and this affection is enough to give the leaf Pokemon the second win she needs, to rise to her feet once more and charge in for a body slam. Not being an especially mobile creature, Gulpin is unable to avoid this, slamming back into the building it was knocked into her Earlier, before facing a serious thrashing as Bayleaf lashes at it with vine whips. However, this once more leaves the grass starter exposed to a sludge attack, with gunk splattering to Bayleaf's face and blinding her, before raining down upon the humans and Pokemon below. Leaping out of the way of a particularly big droplet, Ash reassures Bayleaf that he believes in her, before wanting her to watch out as Gulpin has begun stockpiling once more. Knowing to be taken unawares, Bayleaf responds with a razor leaf in the direction Gulpin was before, while Gulpin is expected launches its spit up directly at the blinded Bayleaf. Due to firing their attacks at the same moment, many of the spit-up blasts and razor leaves meet in the middle and explode, though enough manage to get through and strike the blinded and slow battlers that a cloud of smoke erupts around them. Urgently, Ash and Pikachu cry out for Bayleaf, while even Trico breaks its cool facade for a moment, looking up in the direction of where its fellow grass type just was. For a moment there is silence, then with a roar that makes all the panes of glass on the block rattle, blinding white light shoots out from the smoke cloud, dissipating as it reveals a magnificent Meganium, standing where Bayleaf just was. Whooping, Ash tells Meganium to bring this battle home, and with evident joy at her trainer's pride, Meganium obeys, using Petal Dance, which seems to have replaced her Razor Leaf to strike Gulpin. Though this move is not very effective like all the rest of her grass moves, the sheer power of the attack is enough to knock the Rotom Pokemon to its side, and as she wipes her face clean with a vine, Meganium readies herself for one last body slam to end things. That is until she suddenly finds herself shrinking. In an instant, Meganium is back to her regular size, though this does 
does not stop her from charging and slamming her body into Gulpin. However, as Gulpin is still in its enlarged form, this blow is barely even noticeable to the poison type. Worriedly, Brock asks what they should do, since Gulpin's giving no sign of shrinking and gritting his teeth, Ash replies there's only one thing to do, catch it. Whipping out a Pokeball, Ash prepares to lob it at the giant Gulpin, though this is stopped when above him, an all too familiar voice replies that he took the words right out of their mouth. Looking up, the heroes see Team Rocket back again, sinister grins on all their faces, as Meowth thanks the twerps for doing all the hard work of battling the big Gulpin, so now they can catch it. Then with a malicious cackle, Jesse pitches a timer ball directly at Gulpin's head, which considering the size of the target, does not miss. In a flash of light, the behemoth is gone, and while James bemoans the fact that his timer ball was a precious part of his Pokeball collection, Jesse brings the balloon in for a landing, before leaping out and holding her newest capture high. Leering, she declares that with this giant gulpin on their side, Team Rocket will soon rule the world, then with barely contained glee, calls the poison type forth, with orders to capture Pikachu and all the twerps other Pokemon. However, to her shock and horror, what emerges is a very regular sized gulpin, with Professor Jacuzzi explaining it seems Meganium simply shrinks sooner since it had expended more energy by evolving. This elicits a cry of frustration from Jessie, as she wails that she wanted a giant Pokemon. This is hardly her most pressing concern, as in a feat of impressive athleticism, Gulpin promptly leaps into the balloon basket and begins ravenously devouring all their food. Furiously, the Team Rocket trio attempt to fight the little glutton off, though this is a vain effort, as Gulpin's stockpile spit-up strategy is enough to blow them back while it polishes off the provisions, then comfortably falls asleep. Laughing at these antics, Ash declares that it looks like Gulpin now has a stable source of food and so won't be troubling the city any longer, a claim which pleases the other heroes, with them all walking away, amazed by the fact that for once Team Rocket actually saved saved the day. However, as Ash turns to leave, he finds that Grovile is nowhere to be seen. Calling out for the Wood Gecko Pokemon, he finds it hunched over a flower patch, and when he goes to investigate, he sees that it is gathering up a bouquet of flowers with hearts in its eyes. Ash has never seen this side of the grass type before, and so in a tone of slight worry asks what's up, but here he is completely ignored as Grovile only has eyes for one member of their party, and that is… Meganium? Frolicking over to its fellow grass type, Grovile drops to one knee, presenting the flowers in a gesture of affection, but this is only met with an indifferent sniff from Meganium. Though evolution has matured her somewhat, to the point where her jealousy towards Grovile is mostly gone, she still finds the gecko utterly contemptible, and certainly has no desire to accept flowers from it. Turning her head in disgust, she pads away to seek out Ash in the hope of more praise, while Grovile heartbrokenly drops the bouquet, falling to its hands and knees and weeping at this rejection. This earns the wood gecko Pokemon a pat on the back from Brock, who tells her that he too knows the pain of unrequited love, and this at least makes Grovile feel a little better as it too returns to Ash. Following this stop off, Brock retakes the position of Navigator, and thanks to this decision, our heroes are at last able to make decent headway towards Fortree City. During this time, Ash continues to train with his Pokemon, though to his despair, finds that Grovile is no longer willing to fight with Meganium, instead making displays of love every time they are paired up against each other. Unfortunately for Grovile, this only furthers Meganium's dislike of it, as now on top of being annoying, it has also become an active hindrance to a goal of getting stronger for Ash, meaning that in her opinion, it truly has no business being on this team. Following one of these unsuccessful training sessions, Ash and Brock decide to take a break near a lake, enjoying the natural beauty of the place and the relaxing atmosphere. As Brock whips them up an afternoon snack, Ash takes a moment to polish his badge case, thinking back fondly on his battles with Norman, Roxanne, Brawley, and even Watson. However, this reverie is interrupted as something large and blue bursts from the lake's depths and lands beside the boy with enough force to shake the ground. Letting out a startled yell, Ash Ash drops his badge case, and as it falls, the strange blue thing sticks out its tongue and catches it. Assuming this was a kind deed, Ash thanks what he can now tell as a water-type Pokemon, and reaches out to reclaim his badges, but at the last second, the water-type retracts its tongue back inside its mouth, badge case and all, as it flashes Ash a mischievous grin. A little testily, Ash says that's very funny, but he wants his badges back, but this only makes the Pokemon laugh, a deep bassy rumble that makes the ground shake again, before slamming its tail into the ground and using the ensuing force to leap back into the lake. 
Now frantic, Ash cries for the fish to come back here with his badges, but with a taunting expression, the blue behemoth swims away as if daring Ash to follow it. In this, the creature gets its wish, as without hesitation, Ash takes off at top speed, pulling out the Pokedex as he goes to see if it can give him any insight on how best to deal with this pest. Through this, Ash comes to learn that his quarry is a Whiskash, a water ground type, which explains its ability to move both on land and sea, though he has to admit this Whiskash looks a lot bigger than the one in the image. Unfortunately for Ash, one thing the Pokédex neglects to mention is how well Whiskash can swim, as despite his best efforts, he soon loses sight of the creature as it easily pulls ahead of him then submerges itself in the watery depths. It is therefore a highly dejected Ash who returns to camp without his badge case, wondering how he's supposed to compete in the Hoenn League now. Laying a comforting hand on his friend's shoulder, Brock promises they'll figure out something, since sooner or later Whiskash is gonna have to show its face again, and then they'll get his badges back. Following this, the remainder of the day is spent in planning, so that the next morning when Whiskash pokes its head back above the water, Ash and Brock are ready for it. The first step of their plan is a simple one, keep Whiskash from diving again. An easy enough endeavour, achieved by Meganium and Groval using Petal Dance and Bullet Seed respectively on the water around it, or Brock Slotad, who has been chilling happily below the surface does likewise with razor leaves from below. The goal of this quad effective barrage is to induce Whiskash into hopping back onto the bank, where the remainder of Ash and Brock's Pokemon stand ready to battle it until it coughs up the stolen badge case. It is a good plan, but not a foolproof one, as the boys had failed to take into account one possibility, that Whiskash could simply swim away and search for a new place it can dive. Remembering its impressive speed in the water and fearing a repeat of yesterday's mishap, Ash gives chase, calling for the Pokemon to follow him. Loyally they obey, with Tauros in particular charging at full steam. This causes it to even outstrip the fleeing fish in terms of speed, and seeing an opportunity to keep up with Whiskash, Ash leaps onto the raging bull's back and tells it to keep going as fast as it can. Snorting its understanding, Tauros continues to stampede, soon catching up with their quarry. Seeing this, Whiskash prepares to dive again, a mocking look in its eyes at stymieing Ash for two days in a row, but with a bellow that it will not allow this, Tauros furiously begins to charge directly at the mudfish. In a turn of terror, Ash tells Tauros to pull up before they go tumbling into the lake, but at this point the bull's mind is given over completely to the stampede, and nothing will stop it from trampling its target. Far too soon for Ash's liking, the water comes up to meet them, but before he can leap off, Tauros does something astounding. It hits the water and keeps running, traversing the surface as if it were solid ground. For a moment, Ash can barely believe his eyes. Then from the shore, he hears Brock explaining that Tauros must have learned Surf to help him. Beaming, Ash calls Tauros a real pal, before sitting up straight and ordering the wild bull Pokemon to use takedown. Snorting in affirmation, Tauros charges forward and slams its meaty flank directly into the water ground type, with enough force to straighten its whiskers. However, Whiskash has no intention of taking this lying down, and so retaliates with an earthquake, which in this aquatic setting causes the calm lake water to ripple and rise, creating massive tidal waves which surge towards Tauros. Normally, Tauros would just charge through these, but since it has Ash to consider, the normal type instead takes an alternate path, dodging and weaving between waves as it attempts to close in on Whiskash for a follow-up attack. Unfortunately, as Ash and Tauros get closer to the fish, they quickly discover the waves are becoming harder and harder to avoid, until finally they find themselves faced to face with a colossal curl that is sure to knock Taurus off its feet and send Ash plunging into the depths below. Thinking fast, Ash calls for a fissure, and as the wild bull Pokemon stamps its hoof, the water beneath it splits, shooting outwards to cleave the wave in half and strike Whiskash head on. The force of this attack sends Whiskash hurtling out of the water, and as it hits the shore hard, its eyes become spirals and its tongue lolls out, revealing Ash's badge case. Spurring Tauros on, the pair quickly return to land, with Ash leaping down and scooping up his beloved badges before stowing them safely in his bag. When he does this, Whiskash makes a saddened sound, and Ash can't help but feel a pang of sympathy for the mudfish, patting its wide head and saying that yeah, he understands liking badges, since they're really cool, but he's afraid he can't let Whiskash have them because of how much they mean to him and the purpose they still have to serve. Then an idea hits the boy, and with a smile, he says he thinks he knows a way that it can keep seeing those badges as well as a bunch more, while he also doesn't have to give them up. It can join his team and help him win his remaining four badges. This makes Whiskash clap its flippers with delight, and taking this for a yes, Ash pulls a Pokeball from his belt and adds the Behemoth of the Deep to his team. And that's where we'll leave things. What exciting adventures will Ash and Whiskash have together? How will this new dynamic between Meganium and Grovile affect Ash's team moving forward? And will Ash be able to pull out a win in his remaining gym battles after all the training he's put in? Find out as the journey continues.